Our first scripture reading this morning is Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, therefore I will hope in him. This ends the reading. Our second reading for this morning is equally short. This comes from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Today we begin a four-week um, journey through parts of Paul's letter to the Romans. And um, I'm going to begin with just this from the first chapter, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous by faith will live. This is the reading of our lessons for this Sunday morning. God is speaking to us through these words. When God speaks, those words are true. We can trust them. Would you pray with me, please? May the words that I speak and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week, I told you what I really like about being a pastor and what I really like about the church, broadly speaking, the church as the body of Christ in the whole world. This morning, I want to tell you what I really like about all of you. This part of the body of Christ known as First United Church of Christ in Sauk City. And I'll tell you a story on the way there. This story is a memory that has become precious to me. So if any of you remember this differently, keep that to yourselves, please. <laughs> because I prefer my memory to anything you might uh, recollect on your own. Early last May, I met with your consistory to talk about my coming here for a short interim. I had just recently retired for the second time and the conference folks knew I wasn't all that anxious to go back to work. And so they asked if I would just cover the summer, just three months, while they looked for a longer term interim. Interim pastors, you know, are, are in rather short supply these days. So I came up from Mount Horeb, thinking that if things weren't too bad around here, I could probably, you know, stick it out for three months. After the conversation with the consistory, Dean Daynert was giving me a tour of the building, the offices, the fireside room, the sanctuary. We ended up, as you might expect, up there in the sound booth, where Dean showed me all the equipment that you have that has made it possible to broadcast our services out to the entire world. And I'll tell you, I was more than a little impressed by that. The work that you have done to extend your reach beyond these walls to people who, for whatever reason, can't be here is both remarkable and faithful. It was my first clue that you really wanted to be the church in Sauk City. I think it was while we were up in the booth that I asked Dean what he thought was the most important thing that I, as an interim pastor, could do to help the church along in the coming months. And he told me with very little hesitation, I think we need help finding our spiritual center. A little later, it might have been that same night or a few days later, I can't remember, I was talking with Rose Kleinert and I asked her the same question. And Rose answered also with almost no hesitation, help us find our spiritual center. 
And in case you are wondering, you two, that was exactly the right answer to give. They didn't ask for help in bringing back the people who, for various reasons, have recently left the church. They didn't ask for help attracting new families with lots of kids. They didn't, didn't even ask for help to get back to what you probably think of as your glory days. I've heard each of those requests more than once before. They are widely shared by lots of churches these days. And hearing them expressed is not particularly encouraging to a pastor, mostly because they are largely an exercise in missing the point. But that's not who you are, for the most part anyway. Now, don't go off thinking you're perfect or anything, because you're not. But the heart of this congregation is in the right place. And that is so very important for determining what your lives and your children's lives might be in the church. I saw that heart reflected in the desire Rose and Dean expressed for this congregation to be centered where the center actually is. Not looking backward to what was or forward to what might be, but looking right here and right now in the promise that the Spirit of God would be here now to enliven and strengthen and lead First Church step by step through the dream that God is dreaming with you. As I got acquainted with you over the next few months, I began to see this centering drive all over the place. In the investment you make to form and care for your kids in your Sunday school, in the good work your open and affirming committee has done to open wide the doors and remove every impediment from people who, often for good reason, can't trust any church. I saw it in all the ways you care for each other, ha laughing around the treats tables out in the foyer on a coffee hour, for instance, or visiting our most senior members who would be here if they could, the people you refused to forget. I see it every Sunday down in the fireside room as we gather around the Bible stories and listen together for what our still speaking God has to say to us today. By the way, there really is nothing like sitting in a circle of friends who are centering their attention on the very stories that have fed and nourished the people of God for thousands of years. The gifts that our questions open up just keep coming week after week. Gifts that are, in the words that Hurm read earlier, new every morning. And I've also seen this centering urge in the work of your excellent search committee, what they have done to get you to where you are this morning with a completed church profile that will be made public any day now. I got a sneak peek at that profile last week. And I read it pretending to be 30 years younger and searching for a new congregation where I could settle down and maybe do some good work. When I got done reading it, I thought to myself, yeah, I'd like to meet these people. And you'll see when you read the profile in a few days, that the committee is searching for a pastor who lives out of that same spiritual center many of you are seeking. They're not looking for someone who will help you reach your goals. They, are, they want someone who will help you discern what God is already up to in this church and in this community. Someone who will then lead you to the place where you will be dreaming God's own dream, bringing that dream to life within these walls and within your community. All of this brings me to my central point for the morning, my only point, actually, and to what I think is central to what we will hear from St. Paul as we read through parts of his letters to the church in Rome over the next few weeks. And here it is. Because of who God is 
and what God has done in and through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, your spiritual center is not something you have to go looking for. Rather, this spiritual center that showers us in divine grace, that holds us safe in divine love, that guides us step by step, has already and long ago been given to you. The gift you seek, you see, is already yours. What we lack, Paul will suggest throughout this letter, is the ears to hear, the eyes to see, and the imagination to imagine that this is so. And this, Paul says, the reality that we are already in full possession of this gift, that we are right now fully centered in God's heart, even if we don't recognize it, this is the good news, the gospel. Paul opens his letter to the Romans this way, the first few verses. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the good news from God, that is, which God promised beforehand through his prophets, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now that is Paul at his confusing best. So let me rephrase him a bit with fewer words. This is what he meant. God's good news, first promised in ancient times through the prophets, has become real in Jesus. His life showed us the kindness of God. His resurrection confirmed the life-giving power of God. The good news is that all of this was done for us. It's a gift to us. So this means, this means that your desire to find a spiritual center is itself evidence that you are already there. It is the evidence you need to trust, to really believe that you have been drawn into the center of the divine heart. This good news Paul calls the power of God for salvation. Or to put that in simpler words, this good news opens our eyes, unstops our ears, and enlivens our imagination so that we can see. And what we see is this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Everything we need to live a whole God-centered life today and tomorrow is already ours. It is a gift. Living a spiritually centered life is simply a matter of opening your eyes to what is already yours. And that's just the first half of the first chapter in Romans. There is much more to come over the next few weeks, so I'm not even going to try to give this first installment a neat ending. I'm just going to repeat what Paul wrote to his Roman friend in this first chapter. I thank my God, I thank my God for all of you because your faith is proclaimed through the whole world. And then I'll say, amen.